All right, welcome back. This is the third of our classes on the Federal Rules of Evidence. And basically, I want to continue to just go from Title I all the way down to the end. In the textbook today, a lot of what I would be talking about would come at the end. But if you followed a lot of my other lectures on Nathaniel and Associates, I've already covered basic evidence law. And this would be a better time for us. We will go back to that in a later lecture. But for now, let's uh, talk about the ideas of judicial notice and uh, presumptions. For that to make sense, we need to make an aside. We need to begin talking about jury instructions. For VR chat players, jury instructions don't really exist. And that is, in my opinion, a problem for those players who want the game to be realistic. Jury instructions are an absolutely essential part of trials, but they aren't the sexiest part of trials. This is the part of a trial where the lawyer can win the case by making sure that a comma gets put in the right place or it gets removed from the right place. I remember one of my major trials that I've had going through you know, the whole set of the trials, and then at the end, where jury selection goes in a trial, it comes before closing arguments, but after the close of testimony. So after all the witnesses have had their say, then the judge is supposed to give a description of the relevant law the substantive law and the evidence law to the jury. And they give this out loud because as a matter of law in the United States, we never assume that a jury knows how to read. But we also give them those jury instructions in part of a packet of paper. And that packet of paper, it's perfectly common for that to be about 40 pages long. Obviously it could be more if it's a long and complicated trial. And so before the jury instructions are given, the judge will take that long packet of 40 pages of paper and read out loud every single word of it to the jury. And then they will give that packet of paper and they'll usually give, you know, get 12 copies of it and give a copy to each and every person on the jury so that they can refer to it. These are the judge's written instructions about the rules. But before that happens, the judge will generally uh, allow some argument. Now, this is the court's charge. The court uh, has the final say in deciding what goes into it. The, the judge is treated as the person who wrote it, although the lawyers in most cases are given an opportunity to Here we go again. So usually the judge will write a draft and then give a copy of that draft to the lawyers and then they will have a hearing on the record and the lawyers will argue about what is written down in the draft and then they'll say well you know you called the juror in the, the head juror in this case uh, the foreman and i think that's sexist let's call that person the presiding juror or you know the you didn't put in a comma under this uh, description where you where it belongs this is where cases are won and lost in many ways more than any other place and it's dry and it's boring and i remember taking three hours at one point to argue i mean it can be dry and boring it can also be really exciting if we're talking about whether to get instructions for say affirmative defenses in a criminal case this is where when we don't really know what the law is the judge is going to make the decision about what the law is at the moment of jury of creating that and to make an objection to what is in that draft is as important or more important than making an objection when an opposing witness testifies in a way that we don't like to fail to properly instruct a jury is one of the surest ways to get a case overturned on appeals. Therefore, trial lawyers spend a lot of time and energy on this process. And I remember during one of my big cases taking 
three hours to argue over every single little detail. And we had just had a bad day. It was a three-day trial. First day trial, I felt we were kicking ass. Second day of trial, I thought we had taken some hits. But at the end of the second day of trial, I, you know, it was five o'clock and the judge sends the jury home because this conversation that happens between the lawyers and the judge happens outside the presence of the jury, but on the record. So the court reporter is there writing down every word you say. And I insisted on going over every single little detail for three hours until everyone in the courtroom absolutely hated me, especially the court reporter. You could see it in her eyes. And as we came out of there, my client was feeling really bored and like, you know, what are we doing here? Uh, I said, we just won the case. Because when you argue about what's in the jury selection or what's in the jury instructions, you are arguing over the very meanings of the words that your client is on trial for in a criminal case. Control the meanings of words and the case is yours. How can you lose? And you can, in many cases, walk out of that argument with the near certainty that you've just won the case. And I did in that case. Now, we don't do this in VR chat court much. When I take, because in VR chat court, we don't like to do paperwork. But the whole system is based on the idea that you don't technically have to do paperwork. It's based on the idea that the jury is illiterate, and so the judge reads it out loud. So if you've seen me on the bench, I will, in some cases, before closing arguments, take a moment to discuss the law with the jury in front of the crowd, in front of everybody. Although that's not really the way it would work in a real courtroom, for the purposes of show, we do it like that. So I will discuss the law, and I'll say, all right, now murder is defined as the killing of a human being by another human being. So that means that if you find that the defendant uh, killed this other person and that that other person was a human being and that uh, they intended to kill a human being or you know whatever is alleged by the prosecution, then you should find the defendant guilty. This is the moment where the judge says, if you find this, then the defendant is guilty. If you find that then the defendant is not guilty because jurors don't know the law. So to get the judge to tell them what the law is, that's how that plays out. And there's a lot of moments in the law of evidence that this comes into play because jury instructions are the moment in procedure at which evidence meets substance. You may have heard me say that the law contains three spatial dimensions, substance, evidence, and procedure. Jury instructions are a moment in procedure where substance meets evidence, where they become one thing and can focus on one another. So for matters of evidence, as we continue on in the class, we will see a wide variety of cases in which I will s use the phrase to show. I'll say, uh, you know, this is relevant to show that. This is not relevant to show this other thing. All right, so you may be in a situation where you put on a test piece of testimony and somebody objects and you say, well, the judge says, I'll tell you what, it's relevant to show this, but it's not relevant to show that. At which point, the lawyer who's objecting should say, I request a jury instruction on that. And, the judge, and then you should write it down. So that the judge later on, when you're having that conversation, the lawyer can say, now remember, judge, I asked for a jury instruction on this question. And then the judge will say, all right, I'll put that in and type that in the draft. And it will say, you know, you may not use this piece of evidence to show this, but you may use this piece of evidence to show that. So that the jury is told what it is they are not allowed to think about or what they are allowed to think about, but what that means. And you need to understand this basic issue in order to have a better grasp of what it is we're talking about today, which is judicial notice and presumptions. Because without understanding those, you don't really have a grip on, on these issues. Okay, so let's talk for a bit about judicial notice. I think that this issue is going to be something that serious drama court players can use as a game changer. This can give you an edge, whereas you otherwise wouldn't have it. And the reason why I think that is that in VR chat court, in drama court, we put limits 
on the number of witnesses you can put on and the number of pieces of physical evidence you can present. And real don't do that in real courts. If you want to put on, you know, six months worth of witnesses, there's no provision in the law per se to stop you from doing that. As long as everybody there has something relevant and useful to say, they can do that. But in VR chat court, in drama court, we don't do that because it's a game. And therefore, you can't really be, you know, you have to use your resources economically. And when I'm on the bench, I will often explain to people when we're doing physical evidence, I'll say, you may tell me the physical properties of an object, but you may not tell me the history of that object. And then people say, well, how do I, you know, so, I can, so you can tell me that the knife has fingerprints on it, but you can't tell me that they're the defendant's fingerprints. You have to get a witness to come up and say, I'm the fingerprint analyst and I compared the fingerprints on the knife to the fingerprints on the defendant, and they are the same. So this gives a lot of challenge to the game because you have to, you can't just take a piece of evidence and have that piece of evidence do the whole job by itself. You need a little bit of testimony mixed with a little bit of physical evidence in order to win the game and outmaneuver your opponent on the rules that we play. Judicial notice, if used properly, can be a kind of cheat code, a kind of exploit for the game. What do I mean by this? You can bring in certain pieces of not evidence, but information that you might not otherwise be able to get in. Because as far as I know, there is no limit on how much a VR chat court judge can take judicial notice. And it would be ridiculous for them for such a rule to exist. We couldn't make a rule like that if we wanted to. Because judicial notice can be either sua sponte or on motion. We'll talk about those terms for meaning. Sua sponte is Latin. It means spontaneous. It means without warning. In military matters, to say that we act sua sponte means that we act without premeditation, tactically, or we act without a prior plan. And certain generals would have a history of sua sponte action. So Eisenhower during World War II was famous for his sua sponte actions. Oftentimes generals will make decisions in battle without actually telling any of their lower down subordinates what the decision is until the decision has to be made. There are good reasons for this. This is a good way of thinking. These are what I call battlefield decisions. Uh, you don't actually want to make the decision until the moment that it comes to do it. And there's a little YouTube video by John Cleese called Creativity and Management, where he will talk about the importance of not making a creative decision until the very last moment. And so you can do that. And for military purposes, another advantage of this is it prevents you from being spied on. Because if even you don't know what it is you're going to do next, how can your enemy know? what it is you're going to do next. In law, sua sponte has a slightly different meaning. In law, when we, we mean that a judge did it without a lawyer asking them to do it. Okay? And there are some things that a judge is allowed to do without a lawyer asking them to do it, and other things that a judge is not allowed to do without a lawyer asking them to do it. Because in some cases, for a judge to act sua sponte would really be like taking sides in the case. I remember being uh, very upset at one point and arguing on the record, or at least making it very clear that this had happened on the record. When it seemed to me there was a defect in uh, criminal pleading against a client of mine, this is all on the record, and uh, the judge made a... Uh, a change in the charging instrument, sua sponte, without being asked by the prosecuting attorney. And I thought that was outrageous, that the court shouldn't have its job to be to charge people with crimes. Their job is to assess whether the charges are valid. And for the judge to change the charging instrument implied that the judge was non-neutral. And that pissed me off immensely. Judges shouldn't do that. But the... Uh, that's what sua sponte means, and courts may take judicial notice sua sponte. Now, what do I mean when I say judicial notice? 
I mean that there are certain pieces of information which everybody knows, but which it would be a huge bother to put on evidence for. So the famous case of judicial notice, what talked about in law school, uh, and I may get some of these details wrong, is a case where Abraham Lincoln was the defense attorney. Lincoln was a defense attorney before he was president. And it was a case, a trial that he won by pointing out that on a night in question, it was a full moon, or maybe that it wasn't a full moon. I, I think that it was a full moon and that therefore the light of the moon on the night in question, the night that somebody was said to have committed some crime, let's say murder, uh, that a particular witness would have been able to see what was going on because it was a full moon, or that a particular witness wouldn't have been able to see what was going on because it was a new moon, because there was no moon in the sky, and it was the middle of the country, and therefore there was no light. Okay, well, how do you prove that on a particular night there was no moon? I mean, that may be absolutely essential information. That may decide who wins your case and who loses it. But who do you call? Do you call just random people from town and put them on the stand and have them say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? On March 6th, whatever, there was a full moon? That would be bizarre and a waste of everyone's time. No, that information is contained in a, a lunar calendar. It's contained in an almanac. And although a lunar calendar is not necessarily evidence, it's a physical thing, nevertheless, a court may refer to it. They may say, well, you know, and this is, it's in the almanac. If it's in the almanac, thinks the judge, it must be true. Well, of course, almanacs make mistakes. Of course, maps mislead. But these things create the possibility for the judge to not get bogged down in minor details that are pretty obvious. So if a thing is obvious, the court may take judicial notice of it if it's something like the uh, light of the moon. So let me get the rule here. And what it says is uh, that uh, this is a court may take judicial notice if something is generally known in the trial court's jurisdiction or can be accurately and readily determined from sources whose accuracy cannot be reasonably questioned. All right, so if something's generally known in town, then all right, that's, that's uh, acceptable. But don't think that that allows you to bring in reputation by way of judicial notice. You cannot do that. You cannot say... So-and-so is a, a violent sumbitch, and everybody in town knows it, and the court is now taking judicial notice of the fact that so-and-so is a violent sumbitch. No, you can't do that. You cannot, use rep you cannot uh, use reputation for purposes of judicial notice, or you cannot, and you also cannot be involved in the actual facts of the case. The fact that the moon was shining down on a particular day is not really the fact of the case. That's it was shining down on everybody, right? As it says in, uh, there's a, I think a player in Warcraft Three, one of the night elves who says, "Moonlight shines upon the innocent and the guilty alike." Well, there you have it. So you can take judicial notice of the moon, but not on the question of innocence and guilt. So. For purposes, mainly where we would see this is in things that are contained in almanacs, encyclopedias, etc. And it has to be something that nobody has a major objection to. If anybody can show, you know, judge, that might not be true, then it's not appropriate for judicial notice. This is not for things which are controversial. These are things which are well established and obvious, but which need to be uh, set up like that. I'll give you an example. In uh, one of my trials, the one I'm tell I tell the most stories about, it was alleged that my client had taken his car and tried to drive a police officer 
into traffic, that there was a four-lane highway, uh, two lanes going one way and two lanes going the other way, and that my client was in the far lane, the police officer was in the lane next to him, and it was alleged that my client had swung the steering wheel in order to drive the police car into traffic because he just hates them pigs. This was a complete fabrication. It was utter bullshit. My client had done no such thing. And I knew that my client had done no such thing because the uh, police officer in question had a videotape from his own dash cam showing my client not doing anything like that. And so, I, you know, the police officer in that case didn't know, and by the way, it's completely okay for me to tell you this. I have my client's full permission, my former client's full permission to tell the story anywhere I want. That case, that cop didn't know that we had the video. I don't know how he didn't know, but he didn't know until trial had was just about to begin or until just after opening statements. He didn't know that they had the video. So once I had it, he absolutely had egg on his face. I cross-examined him, showed it, said, this is the video from your dash cam. Uh, it doesn't show my client doing anything wrong. And he took the position, this cop, well, you don't understand, uh, Mr. Pure, uh, your client did the bad thing before I turned on the camera. You see, I couldn't have possibly turned on the camera unless I knew something bad was going to happen, and then the bad thing happened, and then I turn on the camera, and that's why the camera doesn't show your client doing the bad thing that I am saying he did. So what I could have done, I don't think I actually did this, because I instead cross-examined him about the point, but what I could have done is I could have taken because the, a map, because I said it was a four-lane road, Two lanes over here and two lanes over here going the other way. Right. So I could have taken a map of the town and showed that, because this was true, that the moment the police officer turned on the camera was the moment that the four-lane road began, that it was a two-lane road that turned into a four-lane road. It widened out. And that prior to the police officer turning on that camera, there was no four-lane road. Well, if there was no four-lane road, how could my client have possibly run this guy into traffic before the camera was on? Before the camera was on, that was impossible. Yeah? So the fact of where the two-lane road turns into a four-lane road would be an excellent subject for judicial notice. I could show the court Google Maps, which is a source that uh, is um, accurate and readily determinable and whose accuracy cannot reasonably be questioned. Google Maps definitely would qualify as that. I could show that to the judge and say, judge, please take judicial notice of this fact. And I could do that. All right, so that's the basic idea of judicial notice, but I need to lay out uh, the criminal system uh, because the rules for judicial notice, like the rules for presumption, are different in criminal cases against the defendant than they are in civil cases and different than they are in criminal cases when the defendant is the one who wants to use them. Lots of criminal cases have rules which are there to benefit the defendant. Criminal cases are, in terms of the rules of evidence, lopsided. The defense has evidence advantages that the prosecution does not have, and judicial notice and presumptions are one of them. And I have heard prosecuting attorneys whine and moan about how they think this situation is unfair. And I believe I... Uh, I don't know if I actually said this, so I just wanted to, but I, I, uh, I may have said at one point, oh, you know, I feel very bad for you that you have these uh, evidentiary disadvantages. I'll tell you what, uh, you can, I will waive all rights 
and uh, you can have all the evidence advantages that I have. You, Mr. Madam Prosecuting Attorney, you can have all those advantages just like I do in the interest of fairness. And in the interest of fairness, you agree that the police officers now take orders from me. Give me your army, and I will give you my tiny evidentiary advantages. None of them have ever taken me up on that. All right? The defendant in a criminal case has evidentiary advantages precisely because the other side has an army. That's what it's there for. So uh, when we deal with judicial notice, it is like when we deal with presumptions. It is vitally important that in a criminal case, judicial notice, mandatory judicial notice, cannot be taken against a defendant. Okay. That means it's not that a judge can never take judicial notice. What it is is that a judge can never – remember I was talking earlier about jury instructions. A judge can never use judicial notice against the defendant by saying to the jury, this is true. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I, the judge, am telling you this is true, and you must accept that this is true. In civil cases or in criminal cases when the defendant wants to use it, the judge, when it comes time to instruct the jury, the judge will issue a specific instruction to the jury, and they'll say, this is true. That's it. Just take it as true. If you think it's not true, I don't care. Go back there and pretend it's true. You cannot, you must not ever allow a judge to do that in a criminal case because if you could we all know what judges would do they would say ladies and gentlemen the jury you must find the defendant guilty and then we might as well not have a jury anyway it would completely eviscerate the process so the rule is that a criminal defendant cannot have a mandatory um, judicial notice work against them but does that mean that the prosecution cannot actually take advantage of this for purposes of simplifying the trial, right? Because if that were the case, that a judge can never say to the jury, I'm taking judicial notice of fact X, then obviously that would make a lot of unnecessary bullshit work for prosecutors. I mean, they would then have to go find somebody in town to testify as to whether the moon was high on that particular night, and we don't want them to do that. So the way we cover it uh, is that the judge, it becomes permissive, becomes permissive. So the judge will then turn to the jury and say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I, the court, am taking judicial notice of the fact that the moon was high on that particular night. You, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do not have to believe me if you do not want to. Make up your own mind about this. But if you want to believe me, the judge, you may. So that's the method by which the, it becomes permissive. In a criminal case, the jury has the right but not the obligation to accept the truth of judicial notice. Well, wait a minute. Why does that matter? In other words, why do we have the court even give this information to the jury if they are not required to obey it? The reason we do that is that it simplifies things for the jury. It allows them to do that, and it preserves the record on appeal. Because if on appeal, whatever it is the court took judicial notice of turns out to have been uh, the operative thing that won or lost the case, then – that, assuming the taking of judicial notice was proper, then that will allow the verdict to withstand an appeal. Because on appeal, you have to uh, have enough evidence that a reasonable person could find this, and judicial notice can help fill those holes. Mr. Cecilia, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. So I kind of hate to do this, but a friend of mine just messaged me, and he needs me to get him. Uh, I didn't know if Casey was back to take over the recording. Uh, I don't think so. So you got to go? I do. I'm sorry. 
Oh, uh, no, it's no biggie. Uh, yeah, just send me a message uh, with what you got. Let's go ahead and turn off the recording, and uh, we'll we'll do this another okay, time. Okay? Um, Thanks for your help. Currently, oh, just here, over there. Um, so I think I was at 27 minutes, I think. Let me quickly check. How much uh, do you have, Juicy? I don't think so. Oh, you've been here the whole time, Juicy. You've been dead silent. You haven't sort of said a word. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, then we're good, Mr. Celia. Okay. See you later. Okay. Okay? Want to make sure. Later. Sorry. Okay. Um, all right, so... For purposes of judicial notice... It cannot be used in such a way as to work against the defendant, but it can be permissive. This same principle also applies to presumptions. And let's talk about what a presumption is. You probably heard the phrase, I presume. It's something that overeducated, presumptuous, huh, overeducated assholes say. I just use the word presumptuous in the definition which is what it is. A presumption is not exactly an assumption, but it's similar. To assume something means to take something as true, although you have no evidence about it either way. To presume something is to say that something is true based on just a little bit of evidence but to be open to correction. You say, uh, you're here because of the weather, I presume. Means, I think you're here because of the weather, but if you tell me that you're not, I will believe you. Or we say that something is presumptively true. All right, in law, we have presumptions. And... They operate on a similar logic to judicial notice. This is not evidence. Just like the information that a court takes to be judicially noticeable facts, just like that is not technically evidence, presumed facts are also not technically evidence, although in civil cases they can be very powerful. Now, what are the presumptions? It's difficult to say uh, in a simple way because there are so many. Depending on the sort of case, and it's generally made up by the courts, there is, I mean, you may see in statutes presumptions specifically listed in statutes. Those do exist. So, for example, there is uh, in, I think, it's, it's common for states to have in their self-defense statutes presumptions. So if I remember correctly, in the state of Texas, a person is presumed to be acting in lawful self-defense. Uh, I'm going to get some details wrong here if they are attacked in their own home or vehicle. That allows people to act with self-defense with greater freedom to do so. This is called a stand your ground law, for example. A stand, you've probably heard the phrase, stand your ground law. A stand your ground law is an evidentiary presumption. It doesn't mean that you are allowed to shoot anybody that you want. It means that if you do, under certain circumstances, it will take, it will shift the burden of proving that you were acting in self-defense. So in the case of self-defense, in most jurisdictions, it is the obligation of the defendant to prove in that they were acting in self-defense and not the obligation of the prosecution to prove that they were not. A stand-your-ground law says that if the self-defense happened under certain circumstances, then it will be the obligation of the prosecution to prove this. And there are different kinds of presumptions. And uh, there is the, uh, which pertain to the burden of proof, 
uh, which is made up of the burden of production and the burden of persuasion. What am I talking about? Burden of production is the obligation to put on some evidence, quote, some evidence. During my earlier class on motions, I talked about the motion for directed verdict, as it is called in Texas. This is the idea or the motion for summary judgment, the no evidence motion for summary judgment. This is the idea that there is no evidence of a particular thing which the prosecution or the, the other side must prove, and therefore the case should be thrown out without us even asking the jury what they think. Another way of saying the same thing is that the prosecution has not met their burden of production. Another way of saying it in Latin is to say the prosecution has not met their obligation to put on a prima facie case. It means this case sucks so bad that we're not even going to give it to the jury. It, if you imagine a litigation as a dogfight between airplanes, a finding that there is that uh, the prosecution has failed to meet its burden of production is a finding of a defect in the airplane. It's as if you're saying you can't have a dogfight in that airplane because that airplane won't even fly. It won't even get off the ground. So if you get the airplane off the ground, that's called meeting your burden of production. It means you have a little bit of evidence enough that if you were to win the whole case, the higher court would not throw the whole would not throw the whole thing out. So then, a presumption can be a way of meeting your burden of production. Let me give an example. I was taught and in law school that if a person goes completely missing for seven years, that person is presumed dead. Because we would like to believe that a person would not just cut ties with everyone they've ever met and disappear. So if you can prove in some courts that a person has completely dropped off for seven years, the court will, in some cases, find that person to be dead, which means that if that person owns property or if they have a will, then that'll be distributed. Or if that person is married, that, per that married person can now inherit and remarry. You know, all the things that can happen to you after you're dead. And... Uh, this, is, this has happened a couple of times, in that people are thought to be dead, and all of their stuff gets uh, distributed, and their spouse remarries, and then they come back and say, oh, no, I wasn't dead at all, and they have a big problem with that. Is a, the classic short story you want to read about that is Colonel Chabert by uh, Balzac. So the presumption was working against that person. The presumption that the person is, is dead can cause all this other problems. Now, if at any point during those proceedings, the person had shown up and said, I'm alive, I'm alive, in theory, that would have been enough. And there's, ah, well, no, he's obviously not dead. He's standing right there. Or even if somebody had come up and said, I heard from him last week, that would be enough, even if the person who said, I heard from him last week, is not somebody who you would likely believe. That is good enough, in most cases, to defeat the presumption and to stop that from happening. The other kind of presumption, that's called a rebuttable presumption. If it's the kind of presumption that allows you to just survive the motion for directed verdict, it's called a rebuttable presumption. 
And there are lots of presumptions that are based on the idea res ipsa loquitur. Res ipsa loquitur is Latin, means the thing speaks for itself. And so if, let's say, you are going to go for uh, surgery at a hospital, they got to cut off your left leg, and they put you under anesthetic, and you wake up, and they cut off your right leg. Oh, shit! Now they still have to cut off my left leg? It's the thing speaks for itself that someone at that hospital fucked up. And you may not know who because you were asleep for the whole thing, but legs don't just fall off people. Okay? Presumptions are often based on this, and in negligence cases, res ipsa loquitur has a, basically a negligence, which uh, says that if has an res ipsa loquitur has implications in negligence cases, which follows the idea that if a person or a thing was under the exclusive control of the defendant and it was damaged in that process, then it was the defendant's action, maybe not fault, but action, that caused the damage. And that would be enough not to win the case, because if you could come forward and say, well, yeah, I mean, it wasn't me. I was, uh, you know, 12 doctors come in and testify, and they say, well, look, we know that uh, you think that we cut the wrong leg off by mistake, but what actually happened is that we were... Uh, just about to perform surgery, and a crazed madman ran into the hospital with a machete and cut his leg off, well, you've rebutted the presumption. And now you can end up throwing that case out against the doctors. Then there are irrebuttable presum presumptions. There are not very many. This is the idea that a thing is true. Just accept it as true, whether you like it or not. You simply must accept it as true. There are a few of these, and the main thing that you need to know about them is that they are not ever to be used against a criminal defendant. Because if you could, then state legislatures, I mean, this is constitutional. This is, has constitutional dimensions. If you could do that, then, of course, state legislatures, being the racists that they are, would simply make a law uh, creating a presumption that if a person is walking around while black, they are guilty. That is definitely what state legislatures would have done in the 19th century and probably for much of the early 20th century, and maybe, again, given some of the people who are sitting and running on state legislatures. So, therefore, there's a constitutional provision, not a constitutional provision, but it's been interpreted by the courts as part of the right to fair trial under the Sixth Amendment. There's constitutional rulings which say that no presumption can ever cut against a defendant. And what that means is that if a presumption does cut against a defendant, the outcome is very similar to judicial notice cutting against a defendant, which is to say the judge may inform the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there is a presumption at law that if you are, here's another presumption for you, uh, that if a defendant used a deadly weapon on a critical part of another person's body, there is a presumption in law in most jurisdictions that it was the intention of the defendant to kill that other person. Okay? So the judge would then say to the jury, ladies and gentlemen, there is a presumption under law that if the defendant used a deadly weapon against a critical part of another person's body, it was the, in the uh, intent of the defendant to kill that person. If you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, find that this defendant used a deadly weapon against a critical part of this complaining witness, then you may find that the defendant intended to kill. That you may. 
in a civil case, if this person were being not tried for a criminal process but being sued for it, in a civil case, you might be able to convince the judge to say, ladies and gentlemen, if you find that the defendant used a deadly weapon against a critical part of another person's body, you must find that the person intended to kill, as an example. I'm not sure whether that would actually be true of that particular presumption in a civil case, but I do know that in a criminal case, to, to turn it into a must is unconstitutional. That cannot happen. And so this is part, there is one presumption, which is, of course, operative in all criminal cases, and I bet you already know what it is, the presumption of innocence. And we all hear it a thousand times, that a defendant is innocent until proven guilty. That's a presumption. And so that is uh, the basic idea of presumptions and how that plays out. So that, I think, pretty well covers what I had hoped to say on judicial notice and presumption. Short little class, but it's a nice thing to sort of push these initial issues out of the way so that we can get on to more fun stuff later on. So any questions about that? Okay, I think that's it.